I'm Doug Sweetser, and this talk is entitled Enforcing the Unity of Space and Time Using Quaternions. It was given at the fifth international meeting on the ontology of space-time all the way in Albena, Bulgaria, uh, very close to the Black Sea. And I traveled all that way because I thought if there were going to be a group of people who thought that time and space had to be forced together uh, at all times <laughs> and all places, this would probably be, be the group. So I decided to, to travel all that way and, and talk to them, and it really was a productive time for me. Okay, so most of those folks don't actually use quaternions. Like, it's a little curiosity, and that's it. But of course, that's kind of common in physics. And so instead of just presenting my abstract at, such as it was, I decided to actually focus on zero and one and how my work might be able to relate to what they do, which, as I say, never uses quaternions, but certainly uses zero and one. So the first part was going to be on zero, one, the real numbers, the complex numbers, and the quaternions. And the part B was going to actually be simple applications of quaternions uh, to physics. And that would be like squaring a quaternion and saying, hey, the real part looks like it's what the underlying symmetry of special relativity. And the imaginary part is what I'm speculating has to do with gravity. And then if you just take a quaternion and its conjugate and form a product of that, that that might actually be a road to quantum mechanics that most people don't seem to think they need, uh, they travel on. <laughs> okay, so this, this big uh, target um, graphic here is all the zeros and ones that I'm going to talk about. And one thing I noticed as I was making up this talk was that zeros are straight lines on this graph and that most of the unities are nice curved lines except those that are Newtonian. Uh, the straight lines actually come from uh, Newtonian uh, physics, where time and space don't have anything to do with, with, with one another. And the other important thing to notice is that there are a lot of I's in this thing. <laughs> like I0, oh, that's like not having an I at all. And then I1, 2, 3. Um, and I4 is just like I0 modulo 4, something like that. All right. So... Uh, First of all, we got to start with zero and one, because I mean, that's how Piano was able to build up uh, the real numbers and the complex numbers and all the different sort of uh, numbers that are out there. Um, but I think if you think about them, uh, they're a little bit uh, richer than uh, they actually get credited for. Their, their, their relationship is, is kind of uh, deeper, uh, and it's deeper through the trivial group, which sounds kind of ironic because uh, trivial group sounds unimportant. All right, so um, the first, uh, some simple math, that zero plus zero equals zero, and zero times zero is zero, and one times one is one. Now, the trivial group only has one element in it, and these are three different ways of representing that group. And I think some math sophisticated people will say, yeah, and they're, they're, they're basically, there's an equivalence relationship to them, and so it really doesn't matter that there are these three. And it's like, yeah, but we're doing mathematical physics. We want to think about this and what its implications might be. Okay, so when we add something, uh, when we add zero, we end up with zero. So a big riddle we have is like how does time keep on going on? And if you're with this group, you're not supposed to ask the question that way. How does space-time keep going on? And I think of zero as being here now. Boom. Here, we'll, we'll set here now with a finger snap. Okay, now here now is gone. Oh, except it somehow continued, right? I mean, it feels like I'm here now. <laughs> I'm just here now at a later, at a later now. How do I pull that sort of stunt off? And my thinking is that it's that 
the here now is zero at location zero 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 and so i add that together and i get to another moment um okay so um and 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 there's this little math thing um about mathematical fields a mathematical field is is a kind of prerequisite to doing uh, calculus, the study of change. And you had to be able to add and to multiply as group operations in order to say something's a mathematical field. And so I was kind of excited when I realized, oh, wow, then zero here, this trivial group is a, a mathematical field. And then I went and I looked in the um, definition of it and they said, Except there is a special clause, except if the identity for uh, uh, addition is equal to the identity of multiplication. In that, case, in that case, it's not a mathematical field. And I was wondering, well, why did they put in this special um, you know, exception? Because you always have to be particularly wary when you find mathematicians doing special exceptions, okay? And the reason is, is because it doesn't change. <laughs> you know, <laughs> zero never changes. It's got that kind of quality to it. And if you're going to study change, which is what mathematical analysis is, using mathematical fields, to me, you had to contrast that with something that cannot change no matter what you do. And that would be this, um, that would be zero. Zero has that quality. So I think it's important to, well, it's not a mathematical field, it's, um, it's a mathematical constant. And um, take that into account, don't forget about it. I think it's important. And yet one is actually kind of different in the sense that you can construct a continuous group out of one times one equals one. Because what you do is to say, oh, now I'll hit it up with uh, all the real numbers. And so that means that like, if you uh, have a quarter uh, times four, well, that equals one. And no matter what real number you choose, there's going to be an inverse to it um, such that it equals one. And so you can, you can manufacture a continuous group starting from there. Well, the same does not occur for zero because zero times a quarter is zero. <laughs> it's, it's this black hole of numbers. Okay, so uh, in the graph on the, um, on the side there, you see uh, I've got a node and that's it. It's just about zero. And um, then I've got some some loops there because uh, that's for multiplication. And so you start at a vertex, you go along the edge and you get back to a vertex. And so it's just uh, these little self loops. All right, so what's the implication to physics? Well, I treat the universe, the entire universe as the trivial group. <laughs> and then we can only really do three things. We can take here now, of the universe, add here now, and get to here now. Uh, that's how we keep on going forward, quote unquote. And yet, the important thing to me is that it doesn't uh, add information. You know, you're adding zeros, okay? And so the amount of information of the universe doesn't change. And if we want to think about, well, how does this happen in a continuous kind of way? Well, um, you can take zero times zero and you end up with zero. Uh, but even more importantly, of course, is the signal, um, that one, unity, uh, times one equals one. So that can, that can evolve, but again, the, the amount of information in the universe doesn't really change. And so I think that's uh, also kind of very, very key. And um, yeah, so I think it does have implications for how we understand this whole thing about living in one universe. Now, people could say, but there's a multi-universe people. Uh, yes, they are, and I don't buy their story like at all. <laughs> okay. 
So now we graduate to real numbers. Okay. So uh, we've got um, zero. And I think of zero now as this bridge um, between the positive numbers and the negative numbers. And I want to think of the positive and numbers, negative numbers as being very, very similar. It's just that we choose uh, different labels for them. Um, and instead of putting zero dead in the center and then the, the two, two sets looking like they march off in different directions, as I was taught, <laughs> I actually um, put them side by side. And the reason is because, of course, I care very much about the difference operation. And in the zero in the center kind of view, when you say, hey, what's the difference between a billion and a billion five? And you go, whoa, I got to go a billion this way. I got to go a billion five that way. And then I've got to take the difference between those and notice the difference is five. And you go, whoa, that's a lot of work. <laughs> Because I got to go truck a billion. <gasps> well, if you got them side by side, then you can say, well, I'm out here a billion and this much be difference between the two sets is five. And that's like, well, that's that's super easy. In fact, you could go over a trillion and you could go over 10 to the 24th. And the difference of five is still, you know, going to be kind of the same sort of thing. So. I really think about them that way because it's so much more efficient to think about what is the difference between uh, two sets of numbers. Uh, it's not not so hard to, to not so hard to do. You don't have to care exactly where the heck the, the zero is, um, and so that's why I think about it that way. Um, but I also thinking about multiplication and the graph theory for that, and now. Um, it's kind of interesting in the sense that like zero is just uh, has all these 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 pipe cleaners coming to it, all these edges from vertices. Um, the uh, zero has, of course, three sorts of self loops, uh, zero times zero, zero times plus one, zero times minus one. But it also has directional arrows. And maybe it's not clear that those are directional, but um, that the ones that uh, come over um, go like one times zero is zero, but I can't go the other way. I can't go zero times zero is one. <laughs> That's very, very wrong. And so it's this, it's, it's, it's a profound sinkhole because uh, it not only has undirectional arrows, but it has directional arrows. And um, if I didn't have those those uh, black pipe cleaners making this big uh, the big journey over, then that's the group Z two, and it's just this little uh, two by two sort of thing that gives us the rules for oh a plus number times a plus number is a plus number. That would be that that little loop uh, on there, and that a minus number times a minus number is a plus number. That's actually the gray thing with that gray pipe cleaner getting to one. And then, of course, we have um, a positive number times a negative number actually stays a negative number. So um, we have all those uh, groups um, represent, I mean, all those operations kind of represented in that graph. Um, so, uh, and which I had never seen before. I mean, I've seen Z2 before, and then people don't care about uh, zero. Uh, but the complete picture is more complicated uh, than I'd uh, kind of seen represented before. All right, so now we go on to complex numbers, okay? And um, again, we've got two, uh, one more pair, pair um, in there, and it's a, uh, and the multiplication is represented by Z4. And actually, it's this number that got me thinking. It's like, hold it, complex numbers. I always thought about those as two numbers: the real numbers, the imaginary numbers. And now there's a Z4. Where's the fourness? And the fourness is in, oh, the positive reals, the negative reals, the positive imaginary, the negative imaginary. There's my set of four. And then I realized that, you know, I could use I to various powers and represent them all. In other words, I to the zero, that would be the positive reals. I squared. Oh, I squared does a minus. That would be the negative reals. And I to the unity would be I. And I to the third would be the negative imaginaries. 
And it also generalizes really nicely because now you say I to the N, where N can be anything, uh, any positive sort of uh, number, modulo four just means, oh, I got this mix of real and imaginary. So it makes real and imaginary numbers seem kind of conceptually far kind of closer. And we got this group Z4. Well, what does that look like? Well, it's actually got Z2 in it, um, but it's just gotten bigger and nothing, nothing more than that. Uh, zero, of course, <laughs> starts looking a little scarier. It's got more loops uh, there. And um, Z4 is actually kind of elegant. It's, it's very nice flat plane uh, with all kinds of loops and crosses and, and uh, directional arrows. Um, and it's really kind of nice, nice little boxy thing uh, that sits in the plane. But, um, but then um, the guy who organizes is this guy Petkoff. And he, he says, you know, you should be able to, to put... Um, your ideas to experiment. And so I said, well, well, let's do an experiment here. And, and, and the experiment is to show that complex numbers should not be represented by the complex plane, which they've been done for like hundreds of years. I mean, the 1800s where this, this idea came up uh, and people have loved it. I've loved it. Um, but I'm no longer happy. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Do this this following experiment, okay? Because uh, the real numbers don't are not the imaginary numbers. They're different animals, okay? And so now I'm going to do a reflection. And it's going to be around the real or the imaginary axis. Um, but I'm not going to tell you whether it was the real or imaginary axis. I'm just going to hide that one piece of information from you. And which one was it? And there is no answer. <laughs> and that, that to me, that's a problem. It should be like technically obvious which one I did and which one I did not. Okay. And it's not. And then people have known that like since, the, since it was born. It's like, yeah, rotated by nine degrees looks exactly the same. And I mean, exactly the same. And being exactly the same means there is no difference. And being no difference is a problem because these two are different. All right, so can we do anything different? Can we improve on on, on uh, com the complex plane? And so what I did was, um, because we're thinking about space-time, um, is to take to the time part as a real number and a space part as an imaginary number, okay? Uh, and so that now complex numbers are therefore a one-dimensional space-time number, okay? So let's look at this first one where this, uh, okay, so here's a guy, he hits the ball, it flies out to right field, and then it goes backwards. Backwards in what? Backwards in time. Okay, that's all that is. That is a reflection around the real axis because I said at the real uh, numbers are time and I'm doing that. Okay. Now in the bottom little animation, you say, well, hold it. How's that guy hitting two balls? <laughs> He's not hitting two balls. He's got a huge ass mirror there and I'm just seeing the spatial reflection. I'm seeing a reflection in space. And so now you go, oh, so there are no labels here about which one I did, but visually you now know you know that a reflection of real numbers requires that you remember, hmm, oh yeah, I can see that's going in reverse from how it was before. And if it's a reflection of imaginary, well, that's a mirror going on. So you better see like two things, <laughs> two things kind of moving in a mirror reflection kind of way. And so now it should be visually obvious. And as a matter of fact, I say whatever, uh, complex number gra graph you, that you have, now think of it as a line scan. You do a line scan of it, and that will give you this uh, representation that I think is uh, more faithful um, to what complex numbers really are because, because they're, well, they're different. All right. So, um, okay. So now we go on to what I'm calling space-time numbers. Um, this has got four, uh, four sets of pairs. So positive and negative real numbers, positive and negative Im imaginary I 
positive and negative J, positive and negative K. The rules for addition are all going to be the same as before. There's just more rules. Uh, the product table now gets crazy large. Uh, it doesn't go uh, 4 times 3 to 12. It goes 4 times 3 to 12 minus 2 because there's a, a degree of redundancy because I squared plus, uh, is the same as J squared is the same as K squared, the minus 1. Uh, and I, I totally love uh, the zero there because it really looks like a tarantula. <laughs> uh, uh, it's got like 16 pipe cleaners going into it, eight of them bidirectional and eight of them unidirectional because they all come from these, these various parts of the cube uh, uh, over on down. Okay, so um, there, the quaternion is basically our space time numbers, but that, um, except that. Uh, quaternions are done over the four real numbers, which again, I don't think that's the deepest way to do it, but it's certainly the way that uh, uh, Hamilton did it back in the day. Uh, Rodriguez did it back in the day. Gauss, even before them, uh, did it. Um, but I think we're going to eventually have to deal with all eight of these guys when we do relativistic quantum field theory, if we ever do, uh, but we'll try. Um, but the important thing is, even though it's crazy complicated looking, don't get too scared because it's basically a complex number. Oh, except that it's got, instead of I, it has I, J, K. Okay. And well, we're used to dealing with three dimensions in space, so that shouldn't be that scary. Oh, and we've got the cross product and the cross product rocks the house because it means you can deal with a, a bicycle, you know, an angular momentum, which shows up everywhere. I mean, I want tools that can deal with bicycle wheels out of the box without adding anything to it. So the rules are just like for complex numbers, actually. <laughs> it's the firsts, the reals, minus the last, minus the combination of imaginaries. Uh, and then we go outy, any, and you add in this cross product, and that's going to be the product. All right. Um, and these do play a role, quaternions, in physics. Uh, they're kind of minor as things go. Uh, they they you're, they're used to do rotations uh, in space, and they're also used in the standard model. It's the uh, group SU two is known as the unit quaternions. So quaternions with a norm of one. Uh, remember, you got to add that with the norm of one. It's not just it's quaternions. No, no, it's norm of one, and then you get SU two. All right, great. <clears throat> so, um, and to me, this kind of thing is, uh, this graph is comparing complex numbers uh, to the quaternions or space-time numbers. And I think if you were to show this to somebody who is not a professional physicist and ask them the following question, it's like, which one of these numbers, the, somehow it's about numbers, addition and multiplication of numbers, which one of these do you think would be the right one to handle three-dimensional uh, physics and uh, along with time? And I think the answer would be universal. <laughs> It'd be the really complicated one, all right? Uh, and yet, if you do professional physics, um, you use complex numbers for quantum mechanics and you don't use uh, quaternions for quantum mechanics. I mean, we go up to complex numbers and we say that's enough, and then we'll add all this other stuff so we can actually do a bicycle wheel, but it's like, why don't you start with something that can handle it out of the box? And, you know, um, you know, to be honest, this is what uh, hangs up in my basement, like literally, I can, I, I can, I can reach. I, I just reached out and touched it. <laughs> so um, it's part of my home. Uh, it, without the animation, okay, I, I wasn't able to figure out how to make that in a wall hanging. But uh, when I think about numbers, you know, I literally start from thinking about zero and one, and how they have uh, a relationship to each other via uh, group theory and how it continues on to greater and greater complexity until you get to the, the space times numbers, which look complicated enough to actually deal uh, with our, our, the world that we live in. 
All right, and uh, and you know I can't put the uh, my wall hanging up on the preprint server. It's not too bad about that. All right, so so that's my story of numbers uh, that are used in physics. And it, I got some feedback, and it was like, man, I, you you went on and on about these numbers, and I wasn't sure you were ever going to do physics. Well, so so now in this part, uh, I'm going to try and uh, do. Well, again, math, all right? Uh, and the math I'm going to do is I'm just going to square a quaternion uh, and think about the real part. And I'm going to square a quaternion and think about the imaginary part. And I'm going to uh, take a conjugate of a quaternion uh, times another quaternion. Uh, so those are math operations. And yet I'm going to say those very simple math operations can be mapped directly to physics. Uh, the, in the first case, it's going to be about special relativity. In the second case, it's going to be about my proposal for uh, quaternion gravity, uh, which is not general relativity. Um, and then finally, it's going to be about quantum mechanics. And, uh, you know, we had some philosophers at the meeting, and it's kind of like, you know, math is physics. <laughs> Stop. Uh, you don't have to think about other issues. Very direct uh, kind of approach. All right, so um, so a quaternion times a quaternion is a quaternion, and I can take whatever pair of events I want to, um, and I usually think about the change in events so I don't have to worry about, like, where's the origin of, that I'm dealing with? I'm dealing with a delta. I, that delta is supposed to look like it's a differential, like those points could be arbitrarily close to one another in space-time, and uh, I think of them that way. And when I go ahead and calculate the square, um, that part in blue, that is, uh, well, we got dx d, dy squared plus dz squared. That's something the Egyptians knew about, uh, that different surveyors uh, on, the, uh, on the plain of the Nile could uh, uh, agree upon those values, uh, that, that square, even if they don't agree on the x's and the y's and uh, the z's. Um, but the square, they're going to say same. Um, and Einstein's great advancement was to say, well, time and space have a relationship to each other. And it was actually, yeah, th that uh, in, uh, thing was it was in his paper, and it certainly was much more an em emphasis of Minkowski that was uh, that was a a an invariant interval of space time. And then in nine. Uh, 2015, I started wondering, well, what the heck is going to, uh, what sort of physics is going to result if people agree on the uh, uh, light green box? Um, and I actually think it's got to be just as important because, I mean, special relativity is, is absolutely core. Um, the, in fact, when, when two observers agree about the uh, Lorentz invariant interval, they disagree about those other three terms, space times time. And well, why is that of use? It's of use because it now will provide you with the information about how they are moving relative to each other. You know, if all the two observers uh, uh, reported was, wow, we agreed about the interval, and you ask the follow up question, well, what was your speed relative to that other person? They, they don't have an answer. <laughs> That's a problem because they should have the answer. They have the information, you know, and if you keep this space times time terms sitting right next to it, then you'll be able to say, oh, they were just moving uh, along this Y direction. And that's it. That's a, that's a complete story. Um, all right. So, uh, and, oh, and I do own quaternions.com, I should say. Uh, and the reason I bought it <laughs> was because of that light uh, blue box. I saw that and I said, that's, that's the key to special relativity. And that's not an accident that uh, that, that works out. And so I, I bought it in like 1997, I believe. All right. So um, is that interesting or is that just funny? And, uh, and there was one source on the internet, this Lobos uh, Meutel, who thought it was just funny. He's got uh, quite a number of experience points. Uh, it's increased even since then. And uh, I do not happen to like this person, uh, to be honest. Um, although he has greater, 
credibility on the internet in the sense that uh, my reputation score was on the order of 29. Uh, and he went in off on, on this math thing and said, oh, this is the most important symmetry, uh, the, the most important value. Um, and he didn't say what symmetries were involved because you can't talk about uh, these things without saying what, what was what under what group does that value not change? And it was, you know, it's, 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 it's just really sad that it was what I call sophisticated garbage. Um, but that's what I expect from Lobos. Okay, so, um, and this is a dangerous question for me to ask um, because um, because I am a fringe physicist in the sense that I am not a professional um, and therefore fringe physicists have contributed so far just about nothing. <laughs> and uh, they always bring an account Einstein, okay? But I'll tell you why. I'm, I, he, let me read the quote, okay? And it's not from Einstein, okay? It's from Abraham Pays, who did a scientific biography of Einstein, and it was right in the um, in the uh, prefix. He said, "Had I to compose a one sentence scientific biography of him, Einstein, I would write better than anyone before or after he, him. He knew how to invent invariance principles and make use of statistical fluctuations." Okay, so this was back in 2015, and I was thinking about that very quote. And I had written down on a piece of paper the square of a quaternion for like the 1700th time. <laughs> and then I said, okay, I just had a, a, a proposal for how gravity works, crash and burn for perfectly valid technical reasons. It, the proposal not only used quaternions, but it used a different type of number. And somebody said, hey, how does that behave under rotations? And I said, well, it changes. Then it doesn't conserve angular momentum. And therefore, it's wrong. It took me like five days to, once that critique came up, of course, uh, it, uh, anyway, uh, without going too far into it, I, I had nothing. And so I wrote down the square, thought about this quote, and said, geez, what happens if people agree to that, those th other three terms? Which I had asked about, like, like literally in 1997. And I said, hey, what are these called, people? <laughs> and I, you know, got crickets. Um, and uh, nobody said anything. Uh, and it, it doesn't have a name. That's what's weird about it. See, if you think about what is space over time, you go, well, that's velocity. What is space times space? And you go, well, that's area. Well, what's space over space? And you go, uh, space over space? Angles. Those are angles. Okay. And so what is space times time? No, we really shouldn't have silence there. <laughs> it's just a different permutation, okay? Uh, this has got to play a role in physics. It can't just say, well, no, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm, I'm never going to be used by it in any kind of physics ever. I mean, it's too simple. And, um, and so we are going to explore what I'm calling space times time since there isn't already a really common name for it, all right? All right, so um, we're using equivalence classes here for both special relativity and my proposal for quantum gravity. So in special relativity, um, they are, two observers are going to say, hey, we're both inertial observers, but you're moving at a different speed if when we calculate in one reference frame uh, what an interval is, and we do it in the other one, and the real part is exactly the same, all right? Uh, and here is the Minkowski space-time diagram. Um, if the number is, that, that squared number, is, if it's positive, it's going to be in the time-like part of the light cone. Oh, I should say, if, it, if you calculate it and the real part is like zero, then you're dealing with the black lines there, you're dealing with the light cone itself. Uh, and if it's negative, that's the world of uh, space-like separated uh, pairs of events, and it's all very nice and 
uh, simple to do. Um, and all I'm saying that is that for quaternion gravity proposal is that the imaginary parts of the square are what we agree upon, okay? And so now we see the zeros are actually the dt axis and the dr axis. And it was only relatively recently that somebody said, you mean there, if, if something is simultaneous for one observer, you know, the dt is, is zero between two events, all observers are gonna agree about that. Well, that's kind of strange. Because <laughs> the one thing we've learned is like, oh, simultaneous uh, simultaneity is relative. Well, we're we're exploring a different branch of physics, and in this one, actually, you do agree on being simultaneous. So this is a little scary to do, uh, but that's what the graph is. And you say, hold it, that graph is basically uh, the light cone rotated by forty five degrees. It's like. Yeah, that's all it is, okay? And um, nature must be using this sort of graph uh, somehow. All right. So what I found was that if I just say, look, here's a symmetry principle, let's all be happy. Uh, physicists in general, uh, we're not engaged. And I think a reason for that is that Physicists usually think in terms of transformation laws, you know, the Lorentz transformation and other kinds of uh, transformation laws, gauge transformations. Uh, and those are all, of course, connected to deep symmetries, the, the, the symmetry, uh, uh, gauge symmetries and, uh, and that sort of thing. But a complete picture necessarily involves both, okay? And... I only provided one, and <laughs> it was not very satisfying. So um, a fellow on the internet, um, Purple Penguin is the only way I know of of him, uh, the only handle I have on him. Uh, he actually came up with his derivation. I had a separate video on it, but I I, I did this one for the group uh, where I, I here's here's the thing I wrote out, and I'm going to break it up into four parts. Um, first of all, we go into the assumptions and uh, that we're going to measure time with clocks that are in our possession, so, you know, wristwatch time, as it were. Uh, distance is going to be measured by uh, a pair of uh, events um, uh, released um, at the same time and then transported to some observer. Um, but what we're not going to do, all right, is that we're not going to say, and we all agree about uh, the light cone. Because if we do that, then we're just in the world of special relativity. And what we're trying to do is relax um, things so that we might kind of get into a different space, a uh, different, different sort of physics, different sorts of transformation laws, different sorts of insights into how nature works. Okay. And we're not going to set the origin, not going to worry about that. We're going to take it, you know, uh, delta between two events. And so once you do that, you don't have to worry about the, where the origin is. Okay. So, um, what should we start with? Well, if you've got this whole restriction on, on how clocks work and how you're going to be measuring distance, well, we actually know a, a coordinate transformation that's, that works. We've got this T prime equals gamma T plus gamma beta X, and you have X prime equals gamma X plus gamma beta T. All right. Uh, so those are totally standard where beta and uh, gamma are exactly kind of what you expect them to be. Um, we know that works fine. All right, but now what we're going to do is we're going to choose a, a, a function, a, a constant function, such that we get a kind of a simpler expression for uh, for uh, time um, in the in the new new reference frame. So t double prime, okay, um, and we're going to add in this constant function a minus beta x prime. And when you do that, you go, oh, you chose that just to wipe out the x, x primes in there, didn't you? And it's like, yeah, that's exactly why I did it. Um, and when you do that sort of transformation, you end up with uh, d uh, t double prime equals one over gamma dt. And you go, well, that is strange. Okay, because <laughs> the relationship we're used to is it equals gamma dt, not one over over gamma um, dt, but that's just a consequence. It's just it's just algebra, okay? So we can't say it's wrong. We can say it's strange, 
because it is strange. And one of the uh, ways that it, it is strange is that if the change in this double time frame is zero, in other words, if, if two events were simultaneous, then in the unprimed frame, they're also simultaneous, okay? So we are not doing special relativity, okay? <laughs> There's the clearest sign possible that we've chosen strange coordinates and, and, and a strange functions such that we've got this strange result. But it's okay, we're being logically consistent. So let's proceed, see how far we get. All right, so now if we think about lengths, and we, uh, we don't have to worry about being simultaneous, okay? <laughs> that, that part's easy. Um, and we fire our little um, photons back and they, um, they land there and we go, oh, so this is gonna land at 2t and 4t and you go, oh, so, so this is back to normal. We've got uh, a dx double prime equals gamma uh, dx. So that's, that's nice. Um, so now if we think about um, dx double prime times um, dt double prime, but we think about them in the in the unprime coordinates, that means, oh, we've got a gamma and we've got one over gamma, that means that's invariant. Okay, that was kind of our our little goal uh, and we've achieved it, uh, but, but that's for space times time. But let's think about speeds. Okay, because speeds is what people normally think about. And you go, okay, put one over the other, and you go, oh, that's the, they're not agree, going to agree about speeds like at all. There's going to be a gamma squared factor involved. It's like, whoa, so things really zip uh, in between, relative uh, between these two frames. That's, that's definitely strange. Uh, seems almost illegal. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So then what I did was I said, okay, let's think about intervals, okay, where we just um, have these, uh, the difference of time squared um, minus the difference of um, in space squared. And um, we, we've got both, both in the primed and unprimed frame, but, and, and they're, they're just, they're just that. They, they just end up, being kind of boring, but it becomes interesting when we take our little, um, where we think about what the double prime frame looks like uh, given the unprimed kind of relationships that we have, and we just do this little substitution. We get the squared, and we get one minus beta squared and one plus beta squared. Um, and then if we uh, toss in um, the escape velocity of um, Newton from Newton's time. You know when he was firing a cannon off of a mountaintop and it eventually made uh, made an orbit and then he was like, no, let's, let's see what it takes to get out to infinity and stop. Uh, that's the value. When you do that, you go, hold it. That looks like uh, the Schwarzschild solution of uh, general relativity. And so that will tap uh, pass weak field tests. I was like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. Now, why did I put this warning thing in here? Um, I did because I actually stepped through this uh, proof or derivation uh, with two people at the conference and they both were like, man, I don't know if you, you're just doing that because you end up like with a result that's connected to physics. And it's like, I'm totally guilty of that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I think um, uh, people don't take me too seriously is that I've been focusing on that for like, a, why don't we just say a really, really long time? <laughs> that, you know, I know you have to do this and I got there and um, people are like, well, you, you, you looked in the back of the book, you cheated. Um, I don't know how to really reply to that other than that's that is the, what I do because I want to connect to experimental tests of gravity and it's not like you have a choice I mean what hey you haven't you know paid enough attention to what Qu Qu uh, Clifford Will has written uh, about experimental tests you got to end up here okay and I am there and that is to me a good thing um, but I'm just saying, you know, take it with a nice big block of salt. But I actually something else happened that was uh, that just recently, and that uh, and that was a realization that you know, of course, this uh, relativistic uh, velocity, where does it come from? 
Well, it actually comes from solving Newton's scalar field theory. <laughs> so it's kind of like, what, am I doing Newton's scalar field theory along with space times time invariance to make sure that things work out uh, well with the equivalence principle? Because that's what, I mean, that's what I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to say that everything about gravity can be expressed in this type of uh, expression for the uh, interval squared. That, and uh, that, would be, that would be Newton, scalar Newton, uh, with space-time time invariance, and that may be the combination uh, that's needed to come up with a, a new uh, proposal that's consistent with the experimental tests. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> but, hmm. I don't have a Lagrange density right there, do I? Um, and, well, now, now I'm kind of up in the field. I mean, certainly when I wrote this, I, uh, I hadn't thought about the, you know, the escape velocity coming out of Newton's scalar theory. But, um, you know, it, it, it's still true that it, it doesn't have uh, a metric tensor, um, it, that, that this really is kind of being uh, um, Number theory, uh, number theory, not geometry theory. In other words, there's no metrics, no connections, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that you know, special relativity is a constraint on all physical theories uh, that you can write. Um, and there isn't like a relativistic. Um, there isn't a rel there isn't a particle associated with uh, special relativity, um, and the space-time time invariance, well, as a proposal, it's kind of putting a, a different kind of constraint on every single physical theory you can write. Um, uh, and, but because it's not based on very, uh, the, a metric tensor, there's not going to be uh, a rank zero, um, uh, sorry, a rank, um, a spin two uh, particle expressing the field theory. So, um, hmm, so, so now, as I say, uh, since I gave this talk, now that I realize, oh, I really, I'm kind of relying on Newton's scalar proposal for gravity that hopefully respects uh, the uh, strong equivalence principle, uh, that might be uh, worthy of, of further study. Uh, and believe me, people have studied quantizing Newton's gravity uh, field theory because it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they always the first thing they they're going to point out is it doesn't respect the equivalence principle and so therefore we know it's this is just a toy and it's a broken toy uh, if it's less broken well uh it might be uh kind of curious all right um and and then of course the the follow-up question is what is this is this uh, proposal going to be different in any sort of way and i think it will be uh, in the sense of um, I'm always going to change terms that involve changes in time and uh, change terms in ch uh, change terms in, in space and um, you know actually I wrote this and I, I st I'm now starting to get worried about it <laughs> that's the pro that's a problem of doing physics is is you know you always end up going maybe I am not thinking about this quite straight because uh, I always said, oh, there's a time thing and there's a space thing. And so the E fields won't change and the B fields are totally going to change because they both got space parts and space parts. But the, the time part, the, now that I'm looking at this and, you know, you write it down uh, in a concrete way, I go, hold it. That's not a time part. That's a one over time part. So shouldn't that be not one over gamma, but gamma? And in, in other words, Shouldn't that be gamma squared uh, E and gamma squared beta? And it's like, wow, that's... So as as somebody of limited skill set as I am, I, I'm always uh, doubting uh, myself, uh, which I should. I should. I tend to take myself with a block of salt and other people take me with a mountain of salt. Uh, and so now I'm looking at that and thinking, well, maybe that should really be gamma squared E. Uh, one, thing's, one thing I feel confident about, though, is that <clears throat> it's not going to be the same. Uh, there's no way that can work out the same 
whereas, <coughs> sorry, whereas in uh, general relativity, I think that uh, the E and the B fields are actually invariants uh, in order to transform like a tensor, and they have to go through specific hoops. So um, I really just think if we measure the pointing vector or you know measure the E field and the B field and compared them at different heights, believe me, that that's probably technically incredibly uh, demanding um, that I think they're going to be different. And uh, I like this sort of test in the sense that it's 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 cleaner uh, than than anything else because it's just well if it's supposed to be the same and it's the same then general relativity is correct and if the E and B fields are actually different at different um, points in a gravitational field then that makes uh, it much more likely that my proposal has uh, is is uh, more closer to the truth. All right. Okay. So um, now we're going to move on to quantum mechanics, and um, I certainly have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and one of the first things I did, in, as a matter of fact, was. Um, <coughs> to think about Hilbert spaces, because Hilbert spaces have a whole bunch of uh, properties that you absolutely must have, you know, inequalities. Um, and I had a few of them um, back in the day. Uh, it was easy enough to show. Uh, but do actual calculations with quaternions mm, in a quantum mechanic uh, context? I hadn't done that. I, I had done gee, I got to get the triangle inequality, I can do that with Q star um, Q uh, sort of situation. Um, so that was good. Um, but if I, I go on with some of these uh, diagrams here, um, I was like, oh, so I've got all these lines that are zero. What if, what if zero was just a dot uh, right dead center? And then unity would be this circle around here. And that, that's great. Um, remember, I'm treating space-time as a complex plane. Because it's a complex plane and I've got a unit circle, that is the U1 symmetry. U1 symmetry is the symmetry underlying the conservation of electric charge. It's like, wow, that was not hard. <laughs> but it should also strike you as deeply strange. Why deeply strange? Well, because points most of the points in there are going to have absolutely no way to communicate with other points in there because they're going to be space-like separated. I mean, half of them are time-like separated, so that's fine, but half of them are going to be kind of like space-like separated. So like, how the heck can they do that? In a certain sense, at this point, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm only using a pencil, okay, uh, uh, which seems kind of low-tech, and wow, Bang! I got to the the, the symmetry underlying uh, uh, electromagnetism, uh, the gauge symmetry of that, and it's like that sounds like a really great thing. I mean, this this is probably a thing, right? Uh, as but now, if I don't think about um, the space part uh, like as a social unit, but I think of each one of them independently, then I've got the symmetry uh, SU two. Oh, and by the way, this is a thing that uh, Lobos noticed, and he didn't think about the symmetry. Um, this d t squared plus d x squared plus d y squared plus d z squared just said, "Well, that's that's what we should focus on." But if you don't think about the symmetry, then you you miss like everything. I mean, to me, it's fascinating that I can just by drawing circles a sphere, drawing a sphere or drawing a circle, I can get to. Uh, symmetries underlying the gauge symmetries of the weak field and um, and and electromagnetism and it's like I didn't do anything <laughs> I don't know is this yes another happy accident uh, anyway I actually don't know how to do a single calculation with the weak field <laughs> so I don't know what to do with this observation other than to say hmm I'm glad it's there um I didn't say one. Well, and are you going to get out to SU3? And I think the answer is no. But uh, I do have the quaternion group Q8, which has eight things in it, all 
that are of uh, size one, all with a norm of one. And I don't know that you need much more than that to do the work, quote unquote, of SU3. In other words, the thing about SU3 is it's three squared, nine minus one. It has eight things for the eight gluons. And each one of those has a normal one. And again, I'm not sure how much more you need than that from your group. Um, so quaternions are never going to be SU3. They're going to be Q8. And maybe Q8 is enough. I mean, it's a provocative Pretend, again, I can't do anything with a weak force. <laughs> Guess what? I can do nothing with a strong force either. But I'm kind of out of symmetries after I get up to eight, which is kind of cool because one of the deep mysteries of the standard model is why these three and why not other things and why not more things? Uh, why, do, why does the story appear to stop beside other people saying, hey, let's invent something even bigger that says there are all kinds of more particles and they're not? Well, I got stopped here, and I think uh, that's a good thing. All right. Um, but as I say, quantum mechanics, huge subject. Okay. So how can you really be way, way, way more connected uh, to what's going on? So I came up with this testable hypothesis, and there's this wonderful book, uh, Quantum Mechanics, The Theoretical Minimum um, by Susskind and Freeman. And I'm just going to go through this entire book and say, can I do absolutely everything they do uh, using quaternions? Hmm. And people just say, no, oh, quaternions got four. You're done. <laughs> OK. Um, well, you can follow my progress, uh, slow as it may be, uh, uh, on GitHub. Um, I've done two of the lectures so far, uh, and um, this is a companion book. And so let me answer that first question here, um, because we've got your space-time dimensions, and yes, those will always be four. There will never, ever be anything different from four, like ever, all right? Um, but then there's going to be something I call state dimensions. And what's every quaternion can be represented as a quaternion series. And this is this goes back to Newton's day, all right? You know, it's like, yeah, I can give you the sign or I could give you the, uh, the series that converges to exactly the same value. And so um, we're gonna have one to n states where n can be infinite, that's okay. Um, and so you see in blue, there's my space-time dimensions. So I'm always going to try and be really clear when I'm dealing with space-time dimensions or state dimensions. In fact, in <laughs> when dealing with quantum mechanics, you're almost always talking about state dimensions. Uh, but you're always working with space-time dimensions because you always see those four in blue. They're always there. And then it's just a question of how many states you have. And a lot of the work happens with just two states. And so there they are. Boom, boom. Um, and now I just have to go and prove everything can be expressed uh, using quaternion series uh, to do quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is another, I think, very deep idea um, that again gets to that graph that was up in the uh, front, and that is that you know you look around in any room and you say, hey, do all the particles here know how to do gravity? Do they know how to do electromagnetism? Do they know how to do the weak force? Do they know how to do the strong force? And do they know how to do all of these at the same time? And the answer, of course, is yes. You know, it's not like this particle says, well, I, I got tired of following the, the Maxwell equations. Uh, I'm just going to, like, chill on that one for a moment. And it's like, no, you don't, you got no moment to chill. And it's like, how do you do all these things all at once? And and to me, that, that graph is, uh, is kind of the way, because it's just a superposition of all of these types of symmetry all in the same space. And so that's why it's so important to me to just be Mr. Automorphism in the sense of I'm always stay doing different operations, but always ending up in exactly where I was because that's where I'm going to be in the next moment. I'm going to be in the same place <laughs> in space time. Okay, so, um, so 
In summary, I'm saying you can deal with special relativity and a new approach to gravity, and uh, we're working on on the you know doing all problems uh, in quantum mechanics uh, using quantum uh, series. And uh, boy, I, do I have a lot more to do? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly do. Um, but if you want to join me or contribute or uh, whatever, uh, certainly feel free to contact me. All right. Thank you very much.